Hi, I'm Lisa Schick. Um, I work in the SICU Trauma. I recognize some of you guys from TNCC this weekend. Um, I've been there since 97 and I've been a trauma nurse uh, probably about 11, 10 or 11 years of that now. I'm going to just talk about basic trauma routines um, and things that um, when those patients come directly from the trauma room to you in the IM, um, IMU, there's things that sometimes we don't get to address. So this will help with the continuing of care. So I'm going to discuss some AKA names, assessment in the trauma room, uh, C-spine workup and management, DVT, um, PE prophylaxis, hypothermia, I'll just touch on that seeing as we live in San Diego, um, diptet uh, prophylaxis, skin care, and femoral artery punctures. So our trauma AKA names, um, anybody know how we come about with those? Yeah, they come from the um, admissions ladies. Try and make up names that would not possibly be somebody's true last name. So that's why they're all over the place. You know, sometimes it's dogs and they get on a roll of dog names and things like that. But that's where they come from. They're assigned when we receive the MICN report. So when the trauma phone rings um, in the SICU, that's the MICN calling, us, MICN calling us to tell us we're getting a patient. Um, they give us all that report and we in fact turn around and give them the trauma name with the medical record number. Um, Non-disclosures still get a trauma name. They come in and we do our best to um, keep them a non-disclosure. That's a difficult um, task in itself with all the chaos that goes on and all the people calling and things. But um, we usually try and identify if there's a family member, a code name to help us um, on who we can allow in and who we can't. Um, and patients that can't be identified, your John Doe's and Jane Doe's that come in, um, the social worker is great. Um, usually they get right on it and they go through all their clothes more than we do. They're very de in detail to figure out who the patient is. And they have a whole algorithm that they use to go down. But basically, um, we just had one last week that um, young kid that we had no idea who he was and he had nothing on him. He just had, was running with his, or on his skateboard with his dog. Um, so he went a couple of days without knowing who he was and finally um, the police fingerprinted him you know there was he was not in the system and we actually aired him on TV and people recognized um, him and that's how we got in touch with his family so the MIVT report um, like I said we give a trauma name they usually give us age and gender um, the mechanism of injury which is really important um, what injuries they, have, they can find on the patient, vital signs if they can get them, and what treatments they've done prior to arrival. So another review from TNCC of your um, A, B, C, D, E's. So this is every patient that comes in, the physicians, the nurses, everybody are all on the same page. We start A, B, C, and we go through this algorithm. Um, airway of course, and then breathing, circulation, control any obvious bleeding, um, then disability, and then expose, um, which is the patient's worst, those, that's what the, the patients complain about most is that we cut their clothes off, that in the rectal. But I think they complain more about having their clothes cut off. Um, and then environmental control means keeping them warm. Um, after we've got through our primary survey and we're, the patient is, we know the patient is stable hemodynamically, um, then we move into uh, FG and H and I, focus adjuncts, getting our vital signs, our labs, um, CTs, x-rays, all that kind of stuff. Um, we give comfort measures um, and then a head to toe assessment and then we inspect the posterior surfaces. Um, those things don't happen always in that order in the trauma room. Um, the head to toe assessment as far as the nursing part goes, we kind of do it as we're going along but at the end that's when we really go over because you know sometimes things get missed actually a lot of times things can be missed and so if you just have the physicians gone over it now you've gone over it and then you turn the patient over to um, either the ICU nurse or the um, IMU nurse if they do theirs then you know we can pick up a lot of missed injuries and that happens a lot um, so for C-spine uh, workup and management 
we do a three view, um, three view x-rays and that's your um, AP, your lateral and your odontoid. Uh, a lot of times if the patient's going to go for a CT of the head, they bypass that and they'll just do a um, CT of the C-spine as well. Um, so uh, competing pain, everybody knows what that is. If they're, you know, there's no way to um, identify if they have an injury, if they're drunk, if there's competing pain, um, if they have a total brain injury. Um, so we can't flex or extend their neck until they're all clear and then we can test to see if they're ready to have that collar come off. Patients with spinal fractures should have uh, exams of the, of the entire spine, which they do. So in low risk patients for C-spine injury, um, after their T and L is cleared, you can have the head elevated 30 degrees and they'll still have their collar on. You need to make sure um, that you have an order for that. Um, and then when they're uh, to clinically clear a patient, um, they have to be not no you know they can't be drunk still. They have to be um, with no competing pain. Um, and so usually our docs wait until they get a read for the C-spine and they like the final read. Um, and this has actually been a huge issue in the past couple of years. And now this past year it's really turned around. We're clearing patients. Um, a lot faster because we have more uh, radiologists on service now um, so they could move along faster in reading their films um, and that's been I think a great patient satisfaction because they hate sitting in those collars as you all know that's like the first thing they want off um, so once they get the final read a physician has to come in um, and they will palpate and they will have them do their up and down side to side uh, all that if they have no pain then they can take off the collar if they still say they have pain they need to stay in their collar until they come back um, into the clinic You have to have an order to have your C-spine, um, your collar off, and so a lot of times they'll come in and they'll clear this, coll this collar and then it's there in the trash and there's no order. So we need to follow up, make sure that they put their order in. Um, I already went over. We, use, we don't use an Aspen collar anymore. We use the Miami J, so this needs, I didn't update this, sorry. This is an older um, lecture. Oh wait, let me just touch on um, doing good uh, skin care underneath your C-collar. Um, a lot of times patients that are in C-collars, well, that come in from the desert or whatever, they're covered with dirt and sand and it's all rubbing in there, so make sure you um, assess underneath that collar. So C-spine precautions are bed rest, they can't get out of bed, uh, they have their cervical collar on, they can um, have their head again 30 degrees if you have an order. Um, T and L spine precautions. So if they're in bed without a collar but they have T and L spine, uh, they still need to be flat. You can do reverse Trendelenburg and they still need to log roll. And you can log roll with someone that's not in C spine with you know less people. You don't have to have the whole group. You can do a couple people. Um, DVT protocols. So um, for low risk patients, there's no risk factors. For high risk patients, uh, there's a, if a patient's going to be in bed more than three days, um, if they have a total brain injury, multiple fractures, pelvic fractures, any type of major surgery, um, if they have a prior history of DVTs or PEs, um, obesity, uh, sepsis, um, and if they're in a hypocoagulable state already, um, and then pregnancy as well, we're going to be doing our uh, venodynes and um, possibly some sort of medical treatment. Um, for patients that are, that are extreme risks, of course, are your patients that aren't moving. So a total brain injury patient that's on a barb coma that keep, that's not moving, um, that's, that's considered therapeutic paralysis. Um, for aggressive ICP control. Spinal cord injury patients with para, para and quadriplegics that can't move. It's kind of obvious that these people are at high risk for DVT. Um, prolonged bed rest, your back surgeries that um, are unstable, um, fractures, uh, pelvic fractures, people in traction, there's at high risk as well. 
So for screening measures for low risk patients, there's no routine screening. We just put venodynes on everybody, but as soon as they're up and about, they're fine. High risk, we do the duplex um, twice the first week and then weekly after that. Um, and some patients, the docs want to do, um, before you even apply the venodynes, they want to get a, a baseline um, exam. Um, and then for the extreme risk patients, so your bone fractures, your pelvic fractures, your um, long-term bed like coma patients, you um, are going to consider an IVC filter. Um, so prophylactic measures on those low risk patients, you get them up as soon as you possibly can. As soon as that seat collar is off, they can get out of bed. Um, active range of motion for those that have to stay in bed. Um, and venodynes and then your um, Lovenox or heparin. Um, high risk patients need their bilateral lower extremity uh, venodynes and they require heparin every 12 as long as they have no contraindications. Again, extreme risk patients, um, severe total brain injury, um, anybody that's requiring um, therapeutic paralysis for greater than five days, um, and if they have lower extremity or pelvic fractures, they need an IVC filter. Spinal cord injury uh, combined with lower extremity fractures, they need the filter as well within five days of admission. So uh, just a little bit on hypothermia. Um, we do, temperature is a big deal. We, um, it, it definitely affects your body system. So we need to, um, we definitely take a temperature. It's one of the first thing we do in the trauma room and we cover them with blankets, warm blankets. Um, so patients that are susceptible to hypothermia are drowning, shock, um, seriously injured, the burn patients. Um, when we know we're getting a burn patient, we crank the room up so we are sweating. Um, uh, pediatrics, um, ETH or drug intoxication, those patients, um, you know, they, they can become hypothermic and not even know it. Their body systems, their thermoregulatory system doesn't kick in until their temperature drops to like 34 degrees. And by then, you can already have coagulation problems and, you know, they don't even start to shiver till then because they're just, they're numb. Um, and then environmental exposure, which we, we still get here um, if people are, you know, down for a long time. Rain, cold, night, wet clothes. So um, hypothermia, like I said, affects all body systems. You um, develop dysrhythmias and you become very hypothermic and coagulopathy, coag coagulopathies. Um, this is kind of small to see, but basically it shows you start, if your temperature drops to, nine, to 36 and below, this is when all these issues start. Um, you don't, um, so you really don't want your patients below, obviously below 36. Um, when they become severely hypothermic, um, you, have, you start having a decrease in heart rate, uh, decrease in heart rate, your Q wave you start to notice, your blood pressure drops, and then if you start to see this, this is called the Os Osborne wave, it's the elevated uh, T wave, you, um, your next thing that you're going to see is um, V-fib. Now a patient that's 28 degrees in V-fib, there's nothing you can do, you can't shock them, it's not going to work, so basically you need to you know, cannulate them, warm them up. Um, doing CPR is the best thing you can start to do until they're warm enough that you can, um, that you can start to, um, I think I missed a thing here. No, that you can um, cardiovert them. So, um, exacerbation of hypothermia, um, prolonged exposure during the recess phase, um, infusion of room temperature IVs um, instead of warming them. Um, treatment of hypothermia is limit heat loss, of course. Um, I was just, I just did ATCN a couple weeks ago and the nurses were talking about this hat that they had. I forget what hospital is using it, but it's like a warming thing. They're big on losing heat from your head. We, if somebody's that cold in our unit, we do just put a blanket around their head, um, but we don't have a special hat for them. <laughs> um, keep patients covered. Utilize a bear hugger um, and infusion of warm fluids with a hotline or a level one infusion. Um, and then increase the room temperature, which is what we always do. Um, and sometimes we have the um, RTs warm the um, air coming through the, through the ventilator for the patient. 
Tetanus. Um, tetanus is preventable, 50% mortality with um, people that get tetanus, so that's not good. Um, last tetanus greater than five years, um, then you want to we always do it in the trauma room. If it gets missed, that's something that might be missed that you might want to look for um, and make sure that they get it. Um, if no prior immunizations, we want to give them the globulin. Um, and then um, it's used for prophylaxis. You know, people have open wounds, people have open bone fractures, um, stab wounds, gunshot wounds, things like that. So for skin care, um, that's our goal, get them off the backboard as fast as we can. And we're really good about that now. Um, inspect all surfaces, see the chin, underneath the C collar, everywhere. Um, the back of the head, um, patients develop um, breakdown pretty easy, pretty quick if, if we're not on that. Um, you know, with your hair like knotted back like this, we get patients like that and um, underneath there turns into a wound really fast. Um, of course, NG tube tapes, we now have some really good stuff, so, um, but that's to be changed every two hours. And then for SI people, you know, making sure you're looking at the, the mouth, pressure areas around the, um, the lips for um, ET tubes, and that needs to be changed every 24 hours. Femoral artery puncture. So um, in our recess room, that's the job of the med student, and they are directed by an intern or a resident. Um, but it's a learning experience for them. Um, so that's something we really want to you know, keep an eye on. Um, there has been some pseudoaneurysm issues um, in the past. Um, so just when you're doing your head to toe, just check that there should be a gauze there um, and just check it and feel it and make sure it's nice and soft still. Um, they do hold pressure. They do do their, their five minute of pressure, so that's good. Um, any questions? Well, one other thing I wanted to mention about skin. Um, depending on how busy it is in the room, we get a patient, I got a patient last week, for example, that had a motorcycle accident. He had road rash everywhere, and it was dirt embedded in it all over. And when you have road rash, it's like, you know, when you skinned your knees when you were little and the air gets on it and it burns. Well, when you're covered in it, it's very painful. And so as I was the circulating nurse, and so as the trauma was going on, you know, he was just so uncomfortable. So I just kept putting um, zero form all over it because then that blocks the air and stops the stinging. But I didn't clean under there. And so then, you know, I wrap it all up and he gets moved really fast. I have another patient. If I forget to tell you, you know, you guys in IMU and in SI, once you receive a patient, you need to take down all the stuff that was put on them and look at what's under there and see if it's been washed out or not. Road rash is, base, is not really our responsibility to do that first washout. If it's severe, the residents need to come and do that because it's, it's uncomfortable and we need to medicate the patient and all that kind of stuff. But just an FYI, if a dressing's on there, it doesn't mean it's clean underneath. And normally the nurse will tell you, if we have time in the trauma room, we do wash out everything, but it doesn't always get done. Do you have any questions? I speak too fast. <laughs> Thank you.